heavy. Cheers, dude. Chin, and furthermore, chin. The spark mug. I haven't seen <laughs> yeah, these. I thought I'd treat you to that. Love it, mate. Um, thanks for having me around to your humble abode. Lovely place. Thank you. No and, problem. And uh, it's it's amazing to see you. I've got to say, this is so. This is the first face to face interview of 2021. For me, is it for you the first face to face? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be weird, isn't it? Everyone's <laughs> used to just staring at a screen. And I was reading an article the other day about um, Zoom. What did they call it? Zoom. Um, Zoom eye contact. Uh, yeah. fatigue yeah yeah because well, you, just... you stare at the the person yeah and then you go oh well to look into their eyes truly would be to look at the lens but yeah know, yeah it completely fucks Sweet. with your sense of perspective <laughs> yeah. i've done so many zoom chats in the last six months i was doing phone for the first six um and then i just for my own sanity switched it up but but yeah. and, and this is the only second face-to-face interview i've done in an entire year there's only been one other. That was Brian Tatler from Diamond Head because okay. he lives in Birmingham. Right. And, and so we met up in the summer in between the lockdowns. But the thing with that is, is obviously Brian's, you know, of a certain age. So we did that in my friend's studio and we were like, you know, fully like, hello, Brian, like yeah. so distanced because I was so conscious. I was like, I can't get Brian Tatler off the Godfather of Thrash. <laughs> but it's, I mean. Yeah, that's just so unnatural, isn't it? it uh, but yeah. I, I'm looking forward to doing more things like these actually seeing humans and speaking to them and things. But it's, it's beautiful to see you man and, and like many people i'm sure this year has been a, a huge period of reflection and digging deep and re, you know kind of thinking well what have i seen where have i been who have i been a lot of that's been going on for me and, and i remember the first time we met i remember it so distinctly it was i want to say late 2010 early 2011 and i hadn't long been working at kareng radio and i was doing the evening show and you rob ian and your dad came in live in the evening when you were on tour supporting 30 seconds to mars yeah yeah and you you rocked up at the studios (laughs) and i'd never at that point because most artists obviously come in in the day before the show and and this was the first time i'd had an artist live on the air usually they come in you pre-record the interview you play it as part of the thing but your, I think Ian or your dad was like, well, why don't we just pop in? We're on early. We're free that evening. We'll come yeah. by. So you rocked up to the studio. You had like a box of gin and beers and like <laughs> drinks. And I just remember, first of all, the fun element of it all, just like, wow, this is how it should be. Like, imagine if every show was live with live guests and you're hanging out, you're having a drink. And then we went out in Birmingham afterwards. And what stuck with me to this day, and I sincerely mean this, is the the operation and shikari as a as a camp still to this day inspires me so much in its internal as much as external ethics mm. and attitude and you know obviously your dad's such a key part of it ian's like part of the family dan your producer's just a key part it's such a family affair and that's always stuck with me and always inspired me and i guess i'd never said that to you before and i felt like after this year of isolation <laughs> now was a good time because it, it left an impression on me because so many people in this industry, as you know, can conduct themselves in ways that are sometimes less than pure and true and authentic. Mm. And, and you have to be on your toes. I find sometimes it gets exhausting. Like, are this, you know, is this person's intention sincere? And I just remember from day one with you guys always just being blown away with the honesty and the authenticity with which you conduct yourselves. And now we're a bunch of pricks. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days when we were still pure and angelic. And <laughs> well, no, even even at Reading Festival, the last time I was there, I was there with my friend Barney Boom from Sonic Boom Six, and and me, you, and him spent a good few hours one afternoon sat around chatting. And afterwards, yeah. Barney was like, "Wow, I'd never spent any time with Rao before." And he's just so humble, isn't he? I was like, "Yeah, man, that's what's great oh. about all those guys is they're just so down to earth and real." So yeah. Well, yeah. No, thank you. This is- awesome to hear um I, and i don't really know i can't really like uh, point a finger at, at why i think that it's just all we've known you know like my dad probably has a big part to play because he's so um sort of anti many of the worst aspects of our culture so you know as soon as we, any of any four any of the four of us get sort of ideas above our station start getting a bit like a rock star he'll slap us back into place like he is like the most punk person i know like yeah. so that's sort of very much and ian is the same oh, yeah, it's, it's a very punk rock attitude isn't it 
and some people might not think that you're a punk band but i'd say everything that you do including the sound for me is is exactly that through and through to the core yeah i I mean i think i mean people argue about what what real punk is or what punk really means but so yeah to us it's the mindset that's all always what it's been it's progression it's community um it's solidarity it's yeah it's, it's and those are the things that we're very lucky to have been been taught from an early age i suppose shout out to keith then yeah and Ian <laughs> and everyone and i love you guys so much and yeah it, it feels poignant to me that this is my first face to face of the year right. now you're gonna have to excuse me because i have notes and i've stopped awesome. doing this I've, st- I've really stopped taking notes because i try and be a lot more present in the moment and not really read off any you know list of questions or talking points or anything but having just like digested and tried to absorb your book your excellent book which is so weighty and dense and thorough um what's the title you'll have to remind me of the title because it's as always with you guys it's a it's a mouthful <laughs> well i'm i'm just like going to use the main title so a treatise on possibility um and then there's like about two two or three subtitles and <laughs> yeah it's um it's a beast it, it's taken like uh, basically the whole of last year like that's that's that was my pandemic year that was that you know, you know me sort of trapped uh living this solitary life in in this house and um yeah and just writing 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 um and it, it was never my uh it was never the aim to to have this you know big weighty opus of, of a book it was um it was just the fact that I explored one concept and it's like, ah, oh, well, then I need to explain this in order for that to make sense. And it just got bigger and bigger. And it was lucky that I was off tour and I had this time to spare. Otherwise, it wouldn't would, have worked. Would it have just been, because you've obviously done books before where you write essays about the songs and the lyrics. Would, was it originally just going to be another one of those, a continuation yeah. of that? But then you found, A, you had all this extra time on your hands. And B, you know, all these ideas that you've been exploring as a band since day one have just become more and more vital and Mm. you know they're they're so um what's the word just they're seeped into everything now aren't they and and we're at a really key time in human history as you get into in great detail in the book and you know i think everybody is on the same page now finally whether or not they're actively participating in that change it, it remains to be seen but almost everybody that i've spoken to from this year-long period of isolation and reflection and you know there's obviously externally there's so much division and unrest everywhere which there's always Mm -hmm. been um, but that's been really heightened in the last 12 months because everybody has a lot more time on their hands i think for better or worse to think about the state of play Mm. and it just feels like such a timely book um so it's obviously born out of this time but it's so of this time as well yeah i I think we've had a lot of practice really in 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 these sort of worlds a lot of um i've never really called myself an activist and i find it's 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 like calling yourself a vegan as well it's immediately like othering yourself Mm -hmm. from and you set yourself up to fail yeah exactly um but i mean yeah we've been sort of thinking about these things and and writing about them you know in in the lyrics and and elsewhere for, for for years and it certainly feels like now it's is starting to come to a head and starting to become like the mainstream like coffee table discussion is you know politics and yeah ecolo- big time ecology and yeah everything yeah mainstream concerns <laughs> mm. better late than never <laughs> absolutely yeah, yeah and it's all because of us you know these yeah. years of hard work and well, getting these messages you, out <laughs> you do say in the book that there's a great essay that actually does pinpoint and, and reference your bands as one of the groups within popular culture it's been oh, a yeah, part of yeah. pushing these discussions to the forefront yeah how cool is that yeah that was awesome um who was the the, the author it was a um, journalist who was it mia bennett who is a i presume some sort of geographer it was a, a study that came out um or an article that came out in like some some very prestigious um uh, uh, geography uh journal yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, i can't remember what it was it was like the, the annals of the global geographer something um, and uh yeah so it was it was this article all about how the, the sort of negative and positives of how you like discuss our issues and it, it sort of focused on climate change specifically and it focused on if if you show people 
you know, the, the melting ice caps, the, the wandering polar bear covered in dirt, you know, looking for... It, or that snacks. harrowing picture of the really thin polar bear. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's been some, so much incredible photography. Like, um, I actually mentioned in the book, I talk about the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards being quite a, uh, an inspiration, just like the, the amazing photography, but harrowing and, and horrible photography at the same time. Because you say um, the caption underneath every single photo is this species is now endangered yeah literally everyone like of the of the hundreds of of, uh contenders for the award yeah so it was was horrible um but yeah so that that style of of you know trying to promote activism by showing the 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 harsh reality the worst aspects of, of uh of human activity at the moment um that actually doesn't have a uh, energizing mm-hmm. effect it actually make it, it the main emotion as we all probably know when we've looked at these pictures is despair yeah. that's what we feel you switch off you become fatigued you feel yeah. completely hopeless yeah it's it's a very it makes you recoil from mm-hmm. the problem and and want, and want to bury yourself um and so yeah that this this article was talking about how actually like showing um we're con- concentrating on beauty which is really interesting. So concentrating on the on the aesthetics of, of a problem and like showing either examples of the beauty that's worth saving or showing um, uh, information in a beautiful way, and th- that's uh, that's what like grabs human attention and that's what um, sort of emboldens us and makes us want to become more active and, and want to galvanizes us as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. You go, well, that looks like it's worth saving. Let's get to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and uh, yeah, and we were one of the examples. Um, there's 1975 and a few, few other sort of like pop acts um, that, that that she used as as a an example of um, of uh, communication that was done well in this in this respect that is hopefully galvanising people. And but um, and it's yeah, always we'll been see. on the agenda, hasn't it, for you guys? And and beauty's always been a big part of it. You know, your music is obviously in the past, and I'm sure will re- continue to be aggressive at times. But there's always been great beauty to the melodies and, and your choice of words are always very poetic and positive. Um, is that something that obviously you've been doing a lot of, I imagine, looking back over the course of writing this book, not just over human history, but your own personal history as well? Do you think with the benefit of hindsight, even if it wasn't always openly and outwardly there, do you think it's kind of always been at the core of what you guys do, this idea of trying to celebrate and, and highlight the, the beauty? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, we are all naturally drawn to it. Like, uh, whether it is um, a spectacular vista, amazing mountain view or or some view of nature, or whether it's human art, you know, we're we're drawn to an interesting um, design. We're, you know, we're drawn to all these things. What's the Um, backdrop that you used on your European tour? I loved when you broke that down it's like a history of yeah it's, what is it, a it was called of? the warming stripe so this was done by ed hawkins out of reading university and the climate science department there um so he's basically analyzing the data of the last i can't remember how long it is now a good few hundred years um that shows the uh global temperature uh and or the rise in global ter- temperature and but it's 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 shown in a really beautiful way i mean when you see it, I mean, for those, for anyone that hasn't seen it, just type in warming stripes into Google and it'll, it'll come up. It, it's like these um, uh, vertical lines that, that start off uh, blue, which represents a, a lower temperature. Um, and then the safe zone. Yeah, yeah. Um, with every um, sort of uh, fraction of degree in increase in temperature, the, the um, shade of the color comes darker and so what you see is you know we've all we've all sort of know the the story by now it goes from blue to, to quite a deep red uh, very recently um and yeah i was just struck by this because it for me it looked like a, a piece of modern art really more than like scientific data and it, it sort of it captured our attention and it fitted within our sort of general aesthetic as well like at that at that time um so it was a no-brainer for us to then use it and and it was great because then we got to tour it all around Europe, which happened to be the warmest summer in the Northern Hemisphere ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was rather, rather sort of... And was this apt. the same tour um, when all the climate 
strikes were, were occurring or were those two separate tours yes this was 2019 so it was a bit before I'm just going to be mindful of this wire because if that oh, comes sorry, out yeah. we lose everything yeah, yeah. let's just put him over there there we go lovely stuff um this was before the global climate strike which was later that year um but yeah the the sort of um the energy was was building um there'd been like some of the youth strikes and things uh, you know fridays for future and all of that was was kicking off so so yeah there was this real um a new attention that people were were giving to this this subject around that time yeah and it, that's the trojan horse isn't it like you guys do it with hooks and melody and that's done with art but it's trying to like sneak in these important ideas in a way going back to what you're talking about that's palatable and entertaining and mm. and hopefully inspires and you know brings people in rather than here's the cold hard facts here's the <laughs> the bleak truth and people just retire into themselves and go oh yeah i i, I can't do anything about that so i'm yeah. just going to sit it out yeah that's what it's all about is getting into people's heads and hearts isn't it and and making them dance at the same time and protest music's always been that like you mm. know let's let's rise up but you know we want to do it with you know a song in our heart with love in our hearts yeah not yeah, anger I mean, and not yeah from blues to to punk um and and to folk you know and everything in between it's it, it's always been um i mean m music if you if you go back into sort of human anthropology it's, it's always been used as a tool to unite us um it's it's it reminds us of our our shared vulnerability we're all affected emotionally by music whether we like it or not mm -hmm. which is quite it's quite well, wonderful. that's why it um, you know elicits such strong reactions for yeah. good and bad isn't it absolutely it's it's like you can almost think of music as a dictator it's like you, it will make you feel something um and it will probably make you feel a similar thing to, to someone else who hears the same piece of music um so yeah it reminds us that we're all one effectively and and that's i you know at the heart of it that's all we've ever tried to do wield these like instruments these tools of unity and try to encourage the thing that music has always encouraged from when we were dancing around a campfire as hunter gatherers to mm -hmm. you know to today at a festival it's 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 unity it's community um yeah it brings people together so the lyric which starts off the latest record which you you know mention in the book and sort of say well here's the the jump point for the argument is this a new beginning or are we close to the end now, you've obviously written this incredibly detailed, thoroughly researched, excellent book about this. But if I now just had to put you like on the spot as a human to human in a conversational context, yeah. where do you stand? What do you think <laughs> is the outcome oh, for humanity? <laughs> I think, and I obviously mean, you speak as you know an enlightened and educated, but ultimately a musician. And yeah. It's important, obviously, to say that as well. Like, yeah, I you mean, know, that's when you get people go, "Well, what, what does he know? He's just a singer." Yeah. So, like, well, yeah, I am a singer, but I've taken the time to look into this stuff, and here's my thoughts. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm very lucky to to have met all sorts of people who know far more about these subjects than I do. Like, you know, on, on, be it on tour, um, be it through writing this book, through through in, interviewing, uh, you know, various academics and experts. And I'm I'm so grateful for that. That that's one of the best things about the, you know this position that I'm in. I get access to people that other people wouldn't get. And um, so, but I, you've done that yourself as well. And and that's what I love about what I do. It's a different thing. But you're in this position where you get to learn from these incredible people. But you've actively put yourself there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think some of it is is like a selfish drive that I'm I'm generally interested. And if I am able to get access to people that normally you'd have to pay tens of thousands university fee to get access to uh -huh. as, yeah, as yeah. your, you know, professor. Um, I, I'm going to take that. The school of punk rock, dude. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, we, we, we've always sort of strived to use our, our platform, you know, to some degree just to, to put out information that we think is, is relevant and important. Um, so yeah, I, I talk about in the book the, the, this, almost false dichotomy but this this infamous and ongoing war between pessimism and optimism and i still sort of define myself as a realist which is just a cop out you know are you, are you an optimist or a pessimist i mean so my I've, dad always says a uh, he's a realist which is essentially like an optimist but with more uh, more information <laughs> yeah yeah well absolutely that's i love that yeah um and 
I, I think with if I was to sort of turn to you and say like, yeah, I think we can do this. We've got all the technology. Which um, we do. Yes. But let's be real yes. about that. And you say that in the book, like we could solve this yeah, today. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's very much, I mean, a lot could of the, being the key word. Yeah, yeah. And oh. should obviously being the other key word, but whether or not we will, that's the struggle, isn't it? Yeah, there, there's a, what I look at, a lot in the book is is the systemic ways we're held back so so tina our song there is no alternative um is all about this the the way the system supports itself it's like a self-reinforcing thing that that keeps us concentrated on self-interest it keeps us concentrated uh on this uh now clearly uh abysmal idea of of infinite growth of perpetual growth on a finite planet which you know, even going back to Occupy and to David Attenborough, they've point out, pointed out what a you know insane sort of idea that is, an ide- ideology that is. But that's at the heart of our whole economic system. So it's like it's as you say in the book, it's the the impetus is on profits, not sustainability. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I think that is is the heart of it. Like, so we have the technology, we have. Um, our ability in, or I suppose our ingenuity is just incredible as a species, and it, especially when we come together and share ideas, which is another thing. Where like we, we, I hopefully look forward to a future where it's it's all about open resource information, how we can work together rather than sort of, you know, competing in in, in various ways. Which science has, doesn't it? That's kind of one of the downsides to it, which you kind of mention. You don't get into it in great detail, but you do highlight the fact that most scientific research focuses on very niche specific topics Mm. and there's not a lot of cross-pollination of ideas going on yeah which has held it back because it is almost like this competitive thing of everybody's trying to advance in their own respective fields and it's like well if we just shared more information and i believe as well religion could play a really positive part the spirituality if you could marry spirituality and science in Mm. a positive way There'd be so much to learn in regards to compassion and empathy and and things like this, which is at the key to, you know, everything that you discuss in the book as well, isn't it? It's ingenuity and creativity, but also it's compassion. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that, that, you know, there's various, obviously the, this divide between the uh, sort of like, it's like a petition wall between each part of, of, of science. And I think a more interdisciplinary approach would be hugely beneficial but I, I think that comes from from people like me and 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 other like researchers and people who are sort of not really involved in any any sort of specific part of the scientific spectrum. no allegiance you can yeah you can you can have this sort of broad perspective you can you can be the uh, the eagle that that soars above them this is an amazing analogy that you make in the book and it's one of my favorite little <laughs> passages because another great thing we'll just touch on quickly is to make this information digestible it obviously has to be engaging and entertaining <clears throat> excuse me and something you do so well is you bring in your humor and and you know your rousems as i like to call them that have always <laughs> been in your lyrics and songwriting yeah a little cheeky you know, sense of humor, which just makes it breaks the, the mood for a minute and takes people out of it. And they go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And you talk about how you kind of like to conduct yourself as a bird of prey flying above the field rather than like a rabbit on the ground mm. fighting all the other rabbits and getting yeah. caught up in the, you know, the fight. Yeah, rabbits are extremely territorial. So I thought that was, <laughs> yeah, that great, was a, great analogy. a good analogy because <laughs> I, what we try not to do is get caught up in the culture war and 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 party politics basically because yep. i don't think the answers are going to come from there i think the answers are going to come from very broad like systems theory ways of thinking so so looking at the 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 larger perspective um, and 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 it's only then you can really see the root causes and and until we fix the root causes um we're not going to find a great deal of, of change in the in the sort of um like it's like putting a plaster on a massive gash like that you know that a lot of our activism and well, a lot of our the other analogy is, is in the like book, which that. is way better and hilarious you say about the meme where it's like a bit of duct tape over a leaking yeah tank or yeah something. everyone knows that meme right where there's that guy he's, he's sort of midway slapping a massive piece of uh duct tape on it on this gaping hole in a, a, a cylinder that's got loads of water and all the water's gushing out that that, that is um a lot of our 
politics and a lot of our activism is it concentrates on these tiny sort of short term solutions and yeah it? little micro solutions that that aren't really solutions at all because there's still the the root cause that hasn't hasn't been addressed um so I, yeah i think perspective is one of the most important things it's 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 one of the main things i see as as my job as a musician to to broaden people's perspective we do that via our music via you know by using by by being influenced by all sorts of music and then making this this melting pot and hopefully introducing people to different styles of music and we try and do that with introducing people to different styles of thinking different different science that that wouldn't perhaps be you know uh, finding a way into their lives and into their minds uh, through any other means well more power to you man like you're one of and there's there's a few more bands now that seem to be doing it architects i think use their platform mm. really productively as well yeah they're smashing. um and it's just amazing because so many people in the quote unquote alternative sphere no offense to anybody who's listening to this who identifies as that but a lot of that scene for me is just kind of like garbage a lot of the information is very superficial Mm. And there's not a lot of depth and critical thinking to a lot of it. So I fully support and champion and admire bands like yourselves and architects and, and, you know, while she sleeps, there's many others that just conduct themselves in a way that provokes critical thought and an, Mm. and a truly alternative perspective, not just a fucking, you know, dyed hair style, you know, or a piercing (laughs) or a tattoo. Like alternative is about questioning the status quo. Yeah. That's what alternative is to me. Thinking for yourself, not believing what you're just told to believe. Um, And one thing you point out, which I want to sort of explore a little bit, is this kind of two-party system, both in politics and then also just on an economical field, people think the only two kind of possibilities are capitalism or communism, and that's it. And you're either one or the other. And it's so reductive, as you say, because of the way the world is now, because of climate change, because of technology, these outdated economic philosophies you know by the great thinkers like Karl Marx whatever they thought then was very applicable then and some of it still applies now but a Mm. lot of it doesn't because we've far out advanced you know the technological um, tools that were around then but also the state of the world is just a it's a whole other beast isn't it absolutely yeah Um, I mean we've struggled with this the first song I think I I talked about this was Gandhi Make Gandhi Sources back in 2012 or something. Yeah, that was around when we um, first met. Flash yeah. for the color area. Yeah, we have a, a lyric in there. You're, you're a to- you're a utopianist. Of, I can't remember. We're fucking communist. <laughs> it's been uh, so long since you've sung it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ba- basically, you bring up these these i these ideas, um, and immediately the knee jerk reaction yes. from people is always, "Oh well, you're a communist then," mm-hmm. and uh, you know. I'm face palming right now. <laughs> it, <laughs> he we've is. heard it so many times. And um, what, what I think it highlights is just the severe lack of imag- imagination and the severe lack of, I mean, it, it sounds pompous, but thought really like, cause, and actually also what it highlights is the competitive nature. They still think, like you say, that it is this capitalism versus communism. There's nothing else. Us versus them. It comes back yeah, to that same always, thing, doesn't always. it? You're either with me or you're against me. Yeah. And that's it. And I won't <laughs> hear anything else. And you're like, oh man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what we're trying to do is like start a conversation yeah. and not have it, you know, because at the moment I think society struggles because we love the entertainment value of a debate. And if there's if there's one thing that I think people really haven't figured it out figured out yet that is sort of debilitating and dangerous in our society, it's debate. Mm-hmm. Because we should have conversation, and we should strive to understand the other person's view. Yeah, and therefore Debate's we can like a competition, isn't it? Yeah, and also they to... want the outcome to be all wrapped up in a bow at the end. Like here's the clear cut conclusion. Yeah, yeah, that's solved. Winner and a loser. Yeah, right. Yeah, Whereas it's... conversation encourages thought. And as you say in your book, in so many brilliant ways, like evolution and, and problem solving occurs over huge, long periods of time, a little step at a time, mm. right? Obviously, now we're in a position where things maybe need to excel a bit more, but it is this idea of like slow, meaningful change, not just like, what's the headline today? What am I going to do today that's going to change the world forever, but I'm not actually going to do anything, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, I mean, like going back to 
to communism like it, it's the the main thing for me is why it's completely not the answer anymore or possibly never never was is because of its inherent um logic of of, of what uh, marx called productivism which is basically the same as capitalism when you really i mean i'm being slightly reductive but like when you really look at it um they, they had no cap on growth either just as capitalism hasn't had, you know it, it encouraged us to to basically constantly chase after economic growth um well stalin killed more of his own people than hitler did it, yeah factually <laughs> my, my history teacher told me he, like, yeah that's written because because of the productivity that you know he wanted to advance russia and bring it into the 20th mm. century and the human cost of that well i mean yeah i guess people would argue that that that, that was how marx's uh work got uh skewed because of again competition on a global scale like yep, yep. communism was competing with capitalism yep so um, well, they were the two superpowers weren't they like yeah. the cold war like all of that again yeah. it's like yeah I mean, so so battle, basically battle battle yeah what at the core of it like what we're trying to do is basically create a whole new system <laughs> and that's up, where but, i want to um, get is like because people will say well it's all well and good saying that the system's flawed and we need to change but then and you know we're not here to solve it of course we're not qualified to but if we were to kind of just throw a few ideas around what do you see as being potential alternatives viable alternatives uh, the, the in first a political thing you have and to economical do, sphere yeah the, the first thing you have to do is analyze your habitat your natural habitat okay what are the limits of the habitat so you know we could talk about the earth. We could use an analogy and just say we're on an island and go, okay, we've got like so many trees that produce so much fruit. These are like the core, like very simple things that we actually need to, to think about. And, and that means we need global cooperation and global collaboration. And that's something that, you know, when I was grew growing up, it was all the, the big fearful thing was global government and like 1984 and all these, these ways that, that society could fall into uh, a, a dystopia basically but now i think it's becoming clear that we need we have to think on a global scale about everything because as 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 earth overshoot is, is is showing us we are using far too much uh, and we're polluting far too much uh, and we're competing over what's left far too much and it's it it's an absolutely obsa uh, insane objective um so we have to real realign ourselves with nature, with our habitat. Like that has to be like number one, because regardless what system, what economic system we then uh, tr sort of transcend into, the core has it has to be in line with nature. Like, and it sounds so obvious to say it, you know, but it that is the the most important thing, and and hopefully that's what that sort of train of thought will be what we see. For instance, later this year at COP26, the, the climate change summit. And, and uh, yeah, but, but, I mean, as we've seen from the, the pandemic, this system can't be paused. If you pause it, like what, what basically the COVID The house paused, crumbles. Yeah, yep. it, it, it has a hissy fit. Like it, it, it can't deal with it. Um, so we have to find a, a, a way, a new way of, of, of thinking, a new way of aligning with nature. The other thing is as well, you can fall into a trap with identity politics, and I'm very anti-identity politics, but there's obviously the case to be made for good reason, and I believe this, like there needs to be in positions of power more women, more ethnical diversity, more alternative voices within these institutions, because mm. let's be honest... Um, you know, and a lot of people at the moment, I think, are like, stop having a go at white men. It's not all our fault. But mm -hmm. if you look throughout human history, all the wars, both, you know, religious and um, geographical and, you know, everything, right? They're all waged by dudes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's so much to be said for, you know, the feminine insight and the feminine perspective. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. I, I think one really interesting thing. Look that's... at New Zealand. Like, the best prime minister right now it seems to and i know everybody says like oh it's she's a smaller a dream, population she? <laughs> she's just like that's an example of like what a world leader should be mm. right there you're just like man why can't we have somebody like that yeah <laughs> why can't we <laughs> instead we're stuck with old boris um yeah i i can't remember what i was going to say now i was going to say something about um women in power oh, yeah well well no I, the, the interesting thing that i've that i've found is 
you, so you, we've we've sort of demonizing and and to an extent quite rightly the the white you know if you want to go even further into identity politics the white straight cis male yes um yeah which, and which is so reductive i think when you break it down to such a way that you define somebody just by the characteristics with which they're born yeah and yeah profile them negatively yeah you i think risk always the same way as people who are just bigots do you know what i mean profiling yeah. and hating for something that somebody can't control yeah i think you have to look at everyone as, as an individual yeah and, that, and that's a human the only a way. human being yeah you said it best in like again going back to flash flood of color one of the first lyrics that i remember striking me about shikari is all countries i might be paraphrasing all countries are just lines in the sand yeah on yeah, meltdown drawn in the sand yeah and i was like wow what an astute observation we're all on this spinning ship as you call it in your book mm -hmm. together we all have to share this planet together and countries are just that it is just a dividing line you know there's beautiful yeah. there's beautiful differences that should be embraced and celebrated and protected and cherished and culture the more diverse it is i think the richer we are as human beings but that line in the sand thing again it goes back to division doesn't it the separation yeah yeah i think it's like drawn as well as is the sort of the important word there because hmm. it highlights the fact that it's like temporally it's it's not um infinite you know they they've been drawn they get redrawn they get redrawn again and by who <laughs> and it, yeah yeah like who's drawing it yeah yeah so it's um going back to what you were going to say though so we don't get sidetracked too much when you were making the example of the white straight cis male yeah it's uh, something that's that i found fascinating researching this book and um amy chua has a book called uh P political tribes i think um and, and and she makes this point that now in america but i'm sure this uh, transpires globally to some extent as well um every it, no matter how you sort of divide people up be it by race uh, be it by class whatever um every sort of contingent part of humanity feels uh sort of under threat and and, and feels attacked even the white cis straight male yeah. and, and and this is why the the uh whatever you want to call them the alt-right the the neocons whatever um why they're so angry and so uh you know they they can't see the sort of errors in in their thinking mm -hmm. because they feel targeted and yeah. and what we do in, you know it's in our nature well, as humans caveman shit, as, isn't it it goes yeah. all the way back to just i need to stay alive we, survival yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We, we, we resort <laughs> to the to the protection of the tribe um and and so what we do is we become even more uh sort of steadfast in our views no matter what evidence is presented um and that's that's the danger with identity politics i think and that and that's not yeah and it, you have to sort of tiptoe around these subjects because you don't want to find yourself um sort of a, being apologizing for for some of the worst um aspects of our of no but if you look at, at it moment, the other but, way you, you let's get on the same page it's about compassion it's about unity it's about love it's about understanding it's about patience yeah. It's about all of these things. And another thing which you get into in the book, which I love, is like, oh, how can we how can we nurture and encourage and bring out the best in all of us rather than mm. the worst, which is what capitalism does, right? It's competition. We need more. That's an ugly side to human quality. And ego is a big part. Like, I just hate ego so much. I've mm. always tried since day one in my life to, like, you know, shed that because it's such a reductive, negative thing. And it can drive people to do the worst of things. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's. I think it's something that we've always, even on a, a sort of emotional, you know, a, a very uh, sort of non-scientific level, just hating the whole rock star. Mm -hmm. This this Goes back image to where we started. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, since 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 we were in a band, like I was always afraid to be a front man because all around I saw the rock star and I saw what, what you had to be to sort of fulfill that role. And, and yeah, ego plays a, a massive, massive part in that. And it's just incredibly dangerous, I think. Um, well, you look at all the, you know, toxic behavior that's now yeah. being uncovered and explored. And that was just like, 
allowed to go on unchecked, you know, for decades, mm. decades and decades since the birth of rock and roll in the 50s. Decades yeah. worth of bad behavior. Yeah, I mean... The, the, the... Because the system encouraged it and yeah. allowed it and rewarded it. Yeah, the, the, the classic phrase, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That has just been proven true so many, so many times. So like anyone in any position of power However small or, or, or sort of... Well, sometimes the small ones are the worst. Do you know what I mean? Whether it's like a low-level band or a local politician, do you know, and you see it in comedy. Like it's these yeah. people, like the jobs worth who are there, like, you know, the hall monitor types. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, get they're taking... They get a tiny taste of power and they're like <laughs> a dictator. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I suppose you can then look into sort of like the psychology of it and if they've been someone who's been sort of beaten down the whole of their life, they... They're going What's some power in there. They're going to use it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, the the the, uh, the yeah the politics of power is just, just just incredible. How do you sleep at night, dude? Just to break the heavy discussions Whoa. for a bit, because I've written a book <laughs> myself last year, and I know just from my book, which is just transcriptions of conversations like this, which is mm. extremely stimulating. But it's nothing like to the level of breaking down human history like you've yeah. done with your book. How do you switch off at night? You're in the edit phase at the moment. I know that phase very well. It's so hard to leave a sentence like, oh, does it need a comma there? Does that word need to go? Could that word? <laughs> you get down to such, I do anyway, with the fucking microscope, and I'm sure you yeah. do. How do you, when you're in the edit phase, because the research is the fun part, you know, when you're just getting the ideas down and you're, you know, you're letting it all out, that's fun. It's just like all creative. And then when mm. you get to the edit, that's like the methodical stage mm. and, and you can kind of get, you know, lost in that. And I'm sure you find that when you're producing records as well. You know, it's, it's how do you step back and allow it to just sit and, and your mind to relax? What do you do to switch off? Oh God! Um, well, yeah, we're very much in that stage at the moment. Like, I'm, I'm literally having an argument about the Oxford comma with, with my editor at the moment. Well, I have it really tough because is... I have an American publisher, so it's totally oh, different okay. rules for me. Yeah. So I have commas in different places. Absolutely. Like... Oh, yeah. So then it's, I don't know how to write anymore. I'm like, am I English? Am I American? <laughs> lost in this transatlantic chaos. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's arduous. Um, I. I mean, it's just all about balance, isn't it? Like, you know, I'm lucky to have discovered various tools throughout my life now that that, have, that help me unwind, that help me balance my life. Like, and it, yeah, it's it's just important to like. So, if I've been writing, you know, the first chapter of the book, for instance, or actually most of them have some really difficult sort of statistics and things to like take on board. And when you live that life, and this is something that I that I talk to the and, and question. The, the experts I got to speak to about like when you're pummeled with this horrific information whether you're a climate scientist whether, whether you're whether you're someone studying government corruption or, you know when this is your daily existence how do you step out from it like it's really difficult and and, and again, that obviously applies to therapists and nurses yeah. and you know counselors anybody that's exposed to let's just say the more bleak harsh realities of life yeah, yeah, and you, you you have to just find your ways to to disconnect from it all. I mean, for me, mindfulness, meditation has been huge. Um, exercise as well, like I love running, um, and music. And I think one of the reasons why the I found the pandemic difficult, you know, but by no means was have I had a a bad time, especially you know considering the horrific stuff that many people have been through. Um, but one of the hardest aspects for me was that i haven't been able to write any music um i, I still have been doing an interview with the enemy that said that you're like I yeah haven't, i just haven't been able to is that still the case uh, yeah i have i haven't even been able to sort of put my finger on why i think there's there's a few things there but but yeah so not having that output that creative output uh makes me make me struggle a bit but um usually um being in that flow state where you're like you have a you wake up with a musical idea and you, and you can spend the rest of the day uh, developing it. That's, that is the, the most incredible state I experience. It, and, and this probably sounds mad, but it is comparable to being on stage in front of God knows how many thousand people. Like there's a rush that I get from writing music that is, is just as powerful. If not, dare I say it more. Um, so not having that uh, 
was has been difficult over the last year but that's that normally makes up part of my my toolbox along with meditation and yoga and whatever else and when did you start and, getting and drink into, yeah <laughs> <laughs> when did you start getting into the healthier side of life because again what's really cool about the last couple of years i think is whilst the uncovering of all the ugly side of the music industry has been occurring which was necessary as painful mm. and horrible as it is to see it was totally necessary and yeah. it's, it's productive and positive We've also seen a surge and an uprising in A, discussions around mental health, which has been brilliant, and B, an awareness of mindfulness and, and healthiness mm. and well-being. When did it first become an active part of your life? Like, you know, how did it come on your radar first? Obviously, I guess through just your own personal experience, but when did it first become like an active part of who you are? I think, I mean, I I'd, I'd, I remember Rory showing me. Well, actually, I mean, going way back, I remember staring at a candle for like an hour <laughs> when I was a kid. Very zen, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember watching. I'd watch like Star Wars. I mean, I was like eleven or something, and I, you know, even that, you know, just the the mindset of a Jedi, just this, and, we, and we've seen it, th- you know, throughout um, like artistic history and in, in how the ninjas pervade as well like this person the warrior c- attitude man complete yeah. control yeah. you know like they have their emotions in check they're like I, I, was, I found myself very drawn to that um and then i think it wasn't until later on that i i sort of approached it you know more intellectually or whatever um rory our guitarist gave me a book um what was it i think it was a. Uh, Siddhartha, which is like a, a seminal like book in the Buddhist scriptures. Um, well, no, not in the scriptures. It's it's still a novel, but it's like it uses a lot of the concepts from from Buddhism. Um, and I found that fascinating. Uh, you know, because as a, as a child of the West, you're you're so discouraged from Eastern thought, and there's so much wisdom. You know, there's a plethora of of, of amazing things to to learn in throughout uh, that world of knowledge. Well, that's what I was saying earlier about combining some of that stuff, you know, these Eastern philosophies like yoga and meditation and mm. Buddhism with science, with Western science and technology. Yeah. And then the possibilities would be incredible. Yeah. Well, I think that that's what drew me properly to meditation. So uh, when I was having what I usually uh, title as the, the worst year of my life back in 2015, um, it was finding out the the clear scientific benefits of of meditation and and, and my mindfulness particularly um and that was the hook then um you know because I'd, I'd had a, a little bit of background in as i say in, in in these little ways that it seeped into my life and i had i tried it now and then um but often meditation in any form is so shrouded in bullshit yeah well, <laughs> as is spirituality yeah and i've been I've been on a bit of a journey of self-discovery over the last year with embracing a lot more of that side of life. Mm. And it's enriched and improved my state of mind and the quality of my life tenfold. And if people want to laugh at that, that's okay. But I know in my heart that the application of those things to my life, for me now personally, has been hugely beneficial. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I, you know, anything sort of within spirit, spirituality, however you, you define it, like there's, Again, there's so much knowledge there. There's also a lot of like fluff mm-hmm. and like outer layers that you can rip out and, and, and dispose of. But there's some real core concepts that we can all, you know, add to our lives that that, that can help. And um and yeah, my, mindfulness was was exactly exactly one of those. So yeah, it wasn't until I was like in my mid to late twenties really that I properly discovered meditation and and started. I think that. As well, after that year of 2015, I, I then sort of started realizing that I'm not superhuman and I do suffer from exhaustion like any human would do when you're on tour. Um, and uh, yeah, th- then I started sort of treating my my life uh, with a bit more uh, like self-compassion and um, a bit a bit more focus on keeping my, my health and, and my mental health. And that makes sense that it came, I'm not saying it directly came from him, but that Rory is that way inclined because he's such mm. a quiet, considered, you know, beautiful dude. And he's always had that. I'd never put two and two together in that way, but that makes total sense to me because he's always had that kind of like calm energy about him, hasn't he? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I think, yeah, I think there's 
so, somewhat some of his parents in him in, in, in that respect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he, he he's um he's a great presence to, to have in the band. He's a great uh, we I sort of call him the fixer. Mm. So he's he's so creative on in such to me that are like slightly peculiar ways and he'll like see things in different ways than I do and he's yeah it, he's, he's such a uh, pivotal part of our, our band now yeah well you all are and that's another thing that I love about you know everything that you guys stand for you know you practice what you preach in every way and so few bands how long have you been a band now 15 years long yeah, yeah? yeah so few bands that have been going that long and operating at the level that you have remain together first of all yeah remain the original lineup secondly and then remain friends thirdly yeah. and most importantly yep and, and you guys are a great example of how a band should you know go about their business in all of those regards yeah i mean i don't i'm not even sure if i can you know say why like it's, it's all we've ever known again i think it's just because you grew up together i think there's a lot to be said for that yeah a lot of the time yeah, there's there's a real foundation there. It's not like you know we were a manufactured band or something. We we've I've, I've known all those guys apart from Rory since I was five, and then Rory five. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Rory. We met when we were sort of fourteen or so. Um, yeah, and I I think we're all you know somewhat. I don't know what you'd call it. Like it's not like we're all introverted. Like Rob and Chris uh, certainly aren't. And but we <laughs> we all have a sort of yeah. A, a degree of chill i don't know to yeah, use yeah. modern lexicon well, like, even I, even rob and i say this with the utmost respect because i love rob like he's kind of like you know he's a, a, a wild dude i'd say mm. there's kind of a, an untamed energy to him which yeah, you want yeah. in a drummer yeah but absolutely. he's still fucking like level and mellow and like yeah you know I, uh, well i think we, we none of us jump into conflict like mm-hmm. we're very cautious and I think that's probably one of the main things that has kept us together. Like there's so many bands, like we've toured with bands, we shared buses with bands where they're just at each other's throats all the time. And <laughs> it's an ugly I'm, situation. Oh, isn't it? Mate. I've ridden on those buses oh. as a DJ on my own. And I'm like, uh, I might get the train guys to the next town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember like being on, on tour on a uh, warp tour, actually. Right. Oh, wow. About, so you're there. We, did you do the full thing? Uh, yeah. This was one of the years that we did. Mm-hmm. And we were sharing a bus for the, this full tour with this American pop punk band who I won't name. Yeah, it's all good. Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> yeah, they would just, every morning we'd get woken up by them sort of like bickering about whose turn it was to like load the merch to the merch stand or whatever. And that's how they're starting their things. day. Oh man. Yeah. And it would only get worse from there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for us, there's like good to be around that for you guys though, right? To remind you how not to be. Yeah. Well, th- there's <laughs> definitely, you know, for us, we, we can definitely take it the, the opposite direction, which can be equally damaging where you like bottle everything up and you don't, <laughs> you're so afraid of conflict that you don't actually have the conversations you need to have. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think we, I hope we we sort of find a balance between them. Um, yeah, just being fucking livid at each other for every little thing um, and being very open in our anger. Um, balancing that with, with being, uh, with bottling it all up. Yeah. You mentioned alcohol a moment ago. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your relationship with booze yeah. because... You know, I know you're someone who likes to drink like I do, but I think the more you become mindful and try and practice well-being and be responsible and take care of yourself, the more you obviously realize that, you know, doing that stuff isn't necessarily the best for you. Mm. And and so it's that kind of push and pull and give and take and trying to learn moderation and doing it for the right reasons at the right times. And in because I at this stage in my life, I don't want to close that door completely and be a sober guy. But after this last year, particularly, I'm so like removed from the person that I was a couple of years ago, where it was just like you know nonstop, um, and it's it's a hard line to walk in this business as well, where you're surrounded by it and yeah. it's so normalized. And you know, tour every night. If you go into a different town, there's different friends. They want to like every night for them is like their Friday, you know, whether it's mm-hmm. Tuesday or whatever. So you know, you find out that pretty quickly on tour every night is kind of your friday too and that can really take its toll um yeah where are you at with your relationship with the uh you know the the evil spirits (laughs) these days because you did offer me a gin and tonic tea as well (laughs) (laughs) which is non-alcoholic i presume but you still Um, drinking and you're in a good place with it yeah well this did you ever not were you ever in a bad place with it um 
it's I've never I've never considered myself an alcoholic, but like you know, everyone has a slightly different definition, don't they? Really? Yeah. I mean, I've I've always just like humans for millennia, it's a social lubricant, like. But it's whether it's a social lubricant or a social crutch and it's like something you actually beco- like come to rely on. And, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm someone who gets a lot of social anxiety. So, like, I've often used it, even before, like, or not before the band, but outside the band. I, I say not before the band. There was never a time yeah, before. Was literally, <laughs> <laughs> Kindergarten. But, yeah, but, like, outside the band, I've, I've always used alcohol, like, at, you know, at parties, at gatherings, at, like, events, like, as as do a lot of people, if not most people, really. Um, that doesn't mean it's it's correct, and uh, and I wish I would have like spent more of my sort of more formative years not drinking, so I would have perhaps developed more of an ability to be myself in situations that I find in anxiety inducing. Um, but yeah, so there's there's been often you know times that that I've relied on. On alcohol just to sort of see me through a situation or, or give me some extra uh, level of confidence and i think being a front man and perhaps someone not necessarily naturally predisposed to being a front man at least in the, the typical sense of you need to be like loud and sort of brash and witty and like always on it and like endearing and charming and um, Which, there's a lot of pressure with all of that exactly yeah um and so, so i've used certainly use alcohol in that respect to like to, to be more outgoing to be to try and be like more of a what people would expect from from meeting a, a front man like i remember there, there was a, a period of time quite early on where like i'd i'd so often get a few things when i met like um like our supporters like i'd either get Oh, you're so much smaller in real life, which is brilliant. Really funny. Um, <laughs> uh, or um, oh, you're you're like you're so quiet, or you're so chill, or like you know. And to them, it it wasn't. Um, it it might have been a compliment, even, or it might have been like just a just a statement. It wasn't meant to be. I like think a, a lot of people just make observations without yeah. perhaps realizing yeah. how those observations will be received. Yeah, but so for me, for someone who was trying to be the front man, I was like well fuck i'm failing mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be this like quiet quiet small, unassuming forgettable dude yeah kind of like thing. shy yeah. diffident person like um so yeah I, I certainly like struggled with like just the, the question that i think everyone asks like who am i like who big time like wh- where what is my character and, and something i've it's taken me so long to sort of accept and uh I, I must defer to the right honourable Richard Ashcroft for this. I'm a million different people from one day to the next. That, I mean, if there has ever been a lyric that is just so true, like for me and, and I'm sure many people, like that's it. And just to be, just to be accepting that one day or in one situation, you can be like quiet and you, you can not be like full of beans. And in another situation, you can be the complete opposite. And that, you know, you don't have to define yourself as a, rigid introvert or uh, as i am shy or uh, i am outgoing or we all weave you know depending on the situation we're in depending on how we're feeling depending on what breakfast we have where our blood sugar is you know there's so much that goes into it well and also dude like we grow and we evolve and we change over time and another thing that you talk about in the book which i really appreciated that you did because it's as you these are one of these areas again where it's tricky and delicate but you talk about how people make mistakes and and they should be allowed you know the chance to redeem themselves um and they shouldn't be you know vilified for something they maybe did that's kind of minor perhaps in their past and and called to task on it today and then their entire future is is taken from them like we have to be very careful in this world that we're in now with you know misinformation and and how basically overnight somebody's entire lives can be damaged beyond repair um, because of an accusation or a statement or whatever and it's i think so key to understand that we're not maybe the person that we were 10 years ago five years ago even sometimes two weeks ago and we're in flux that's not to say that people should be given a pass Mm. but it's tricky isn't it like this state of play right now with um i think a lack of of forgiveness in some cases or understanding for where somebody might have been coming from at a certain point in their life yeah, I think the internet especially coaxes us into this mindset 
that human growth isn't possible like mm-hmm. character growth i mean um we it's profiling we, isn't it i know that guy yeah, i met yeah, him 10 yeah. years ago he was an asshole yeah but maybe yeah. he was just having a bad day as you said his blood sugar was off he was hungover, yeah. tired missing his family whatever yeah yeah if we don't allow yeah any growth and i think i think that's just it's so unfortunate um you know no one no human has never made mistakes like we all do and, and sometimes it's only five years later that you realize you made a mistake you know it, mm-hmm. one thing that I, I i would really hope becomes more of a mainstream dis- discussion is free will um because it, it can be a massively academic pernickety uh nuanced subject especially in academia but like as a general area to think about i think it's so important because once you start realizing that we are our genes we are our parents we are the environment we grew up in uh we are the the school we went to the friends we had none of which was our choice yep we did not choose our parents we did not choose the year we were born we did there's so much that that wasn't up to us yet we have to take full responsibility for ourselves and I'm not saying we shouldn't take full responsibility, but ultimately we do. But I think everyone else around someone who's taking full responsibility has to show more compassion, yeah. has to show more patience. And the, and what I say in the book is we need, like if there was like a phrase to like embed into everyone, it's curiosity over animosity. Because we're all just at each other's throats all the time. Like, you know, obviously within party politics online but but anywhere else we're all we're sort of like trying to chop everyone down constantly and we're, and we're trying to concentrate on what divides us you know the, the clichés the, 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 the what likes unites us so um yeah i think that that whole idea of accepting that we are massively intricate like uh what was the um like uh walt whitman he he said um uh if i contradict myself it's because i am large i contain multitudes Amazing. And, and i think that is is the core of it we are all these different influences almost all of them which we didn't have a say in <laughs> so we just need to be a bit more patient with people that's not to say we shouldn't like put like rapists in jail or something like that of, of course accountability is a yeah. big part of it yeah but at the same time i i think we need to focus on understanding why someone is a certain way instead of just m- massively running just to punish them without any context or without any thought um whatsoever civility is a word which you evoke with great power and and, and intelligence in the book and i love the the presentation of the importance on on that it's, um, it's such a like it's not a very punk word, is it? Well, you, you say it sounds so like something archaic, that belongs but... in a period drama. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not juicy, but it's we need so more civility. important, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, it will come back. Like, you know, it, it, as it's a fine balance, especially when talking about these things again, because they can be taken out of context. But we have to find that we have to rebalance between being civil, being curious, being understanding, being compassionate, being forgiving, and then like actually holding someone to account and mm-hmm. i think we've we've perhaps a bit skew whiff on the balance at, at the moment dude what a pleasure this is like i've had a million and one thoughts running through my head whilst talking with you and it's it's so profound to be in a room with someone talking like this again i've been doing this and really only this for the last year day in day out but all of it's been over zoom and it relates to everything we've been talking about because communication is that it's at the core of who we are as human beings and what we need to be happy and to thrive Mm. and and being in a room with someone like yourself who i admire and love um and talking in this way about all these things just reminds me of what a key period in human history we're in right now and there's so much potential for positive change you know we've had so much time to think about the things we love and miss and and respect and you know and who we want to be um and yeah it's it's a beautiful feeling to be, just be doing this with you in a room chatting i i, I uh i can only echo those sentiments like yeah I've, I've i've missed just yeah having those like more long form interesting conversations and um I, yeah i should say like going all the way back to the beginning like i remember that 
that interview back at Kerrang really well because we had such a good time. Now, yeah, we were on tour, like playing at one of our, it wasn't our first arena tour, but uh, arena support tours. Um, but but we were certainly having, having a great time. But like, I remember that interview specifically being great and you're such a brilliant interview, interviewer and you made us feel very comfortable as you always do. And it's always wonderful to spend time with you. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. It's very ni- happy. It's nice, man. Like, although we don't hang out socially very often, whenever I see you, the exchanges are always meaningful and productive. And uh, I feel like we're kindred spirits in many ways. And um, just in conclusion, the the kind of alternative album that you've put out, um, I don't know the exact title, you'll have to forgive me, but your most recent... Moratorium will do. Again, don't worry about the subtitle. Uh, That's just us being obnoxious. <laughs> it's only because I don't get bogged down in titles, man. But honestly, <laughs> the music on that album, like they're all either like acoustic recordings or, or home recordings. Yeah. Um, I think I, for the first time, truly appreciated you as a songwriter, hearing all those songs in those ways, because, you know, Shikari's this really unpredictable beast, mm. you know, and that's why people love it. You know, it's, it, you go to see, well, you don't even need to see you live. You just put on a record and you, you often don't know where the song's going to go within the song, what's going to happen next. It's always such a visceral, exciting ride. But really hearing those songs in that new context kind of just reinforced for me what a great, songwriter you are and how good at their core lyrically and melodically these songs are and whilst you might not at this point in time feel like this creative fire burning inside you now um there's so many levels to what you do as a songwriter that i think really come to the uh the surface with with this like alternate take record and it was a genuine like joy to hear those songs in that way did you have fun Obviously, you were doing them a lot of cases, I imagine, for stream shows and things like that. But yeah. was it fun rearranging them in that it, way? It and was, was, was it creative yeah. and rewarding in that sense? Yeah. But when we do those stripped back versions, like we don't like to just extract the three chords and just mm-hmm. do a, a very Which so many fight. people do. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it has its place. And there's sometimes they're, they're wonderful. Sometimes that's all you need to, to hear. But, um, you know, as with most things within Shikari World, we just <laughs> yeah, like yeah. to keep pushing ourselves. Yeah. and. Um, so yeah, I, I like to just really strip it down, yeah, but but kind of find something different about the song and like explore a depth that isn't uh, that doesn't shine through in in the mayhem um, of the of the actual version. And and so yeah, they're, they're always really fun to make, and they're you know I'm always intrigued by like what I can pull out and how I can sort of shape shift each song to to be something new, and interesting. Well, this book as well, when you finally finish it, and, and, <laughs> and congratulations, man. I know it's not quite done yet, but in all you know, intents and purposes, it's there. Yeah. And I think as soon as you put that to bed and you, you know, kind of process this insane journey you must have been on, this mental journey you've been on researching and writing this thing, because it's so layered, so detailed, so big, so dense. I think when that <laughs> chapter's closed, excuse the awful <laughs> pun, that's when your creativity will come alive again. I can see it happening because you've just got so much bubbling inside you from the levels of just insane topics you've been uncovering for the last year. Yeah, It must have been exhausting yeah. and rewarding in, in so many ways. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it felt like the biggest project and the most difficult project because like... No doubt. With, with Shikari, I've always got the other guys there with me to mm-hmm. sort of flesh ideas out with. And, and this was very much just solitary just me you know in reading books and then trying to work out how the hell i can explain things in a, in a way that is hopefully uh, understandable and yeah um so it, it was i, I would say is it would there were more moments where i was like literally pulling my hair out than there were in recording albums because you can always play the music back and lose yourself and be like okay you know we're, we're on to something here uh with the book it's it's really, really difficult to get your bearings. You with, drown in all those but, words. Um, you yeah. do. You, you just don't know how to step back. And, and it's like, I imagine editing is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Like mm. when you're just looking at that timeline over and over yeah. again, and it just <laughs> scrambles your brain in such a way that it's almost impossible to like see it. And you, yeah. know, you can spend so long on something and then go, oh my God, is this all just like a mess? Is it all just confused? And yeah. <laughs> it can be so demoralizing oh. and disheartening. Yeah. But honestly, man, like as somebody who 
you know considers themselves a student of, of of literature like i studied literature at university it took me back to the days of like you know reading about critical theory and getting lost in these really you know weighty subjects and to do that like that's not your job you know you're not an academic you're a lyricist you're a frontman you're a singer you're a songwriter to pull off what you've pulled off is an extremely commendable achievement Thank and you, you should be very proud of yourself. Talk about putting a lockdown year to good use, my friend. Uh, yeah. There'll be plenty I, more albums, but that's a one-off thing. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 can, I can say with a great degree of confidence that I will not be doing anything like this <laughs> ever again. <laughs> You've done it, mate. You've unpacked human history. There's nowhere <laughs> yeah. else to go. Yeah, absolutely. Case closed. Get it off my desk. Let, maybe get back to writing uh, tunes again. Dude, put it there. Thank Safe, you for man. reintroducing face-to-face -face interviews into my life. Hell yeah. No, and, it's uh, lovely to see you. Congratulations on everything and all the best with everything. Nice one, man. Thank you. That was awesome, dude.